Hi, good evening. Welcome to this session of uh, Fashion and Cinema. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to Cine Lumière at the French Institute for hosting us again. Uh, we are over delighted to welcome back uh, Jenny Bevan uh, on this stage. Last year she was here on this stage uh, presenting um, Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, for which uh, she created the costumes. Today she's here with uh, John Bright, uh, founder of Cosprop. You probably know if you are here uh, what Cosprop is, but just in case, and just simplifying it very much, they supply costumes to film and uh, TV and theater, everything. Uh, from a hairpin to shoes, gloves, everything. And uh, they will be here in conversation with um, Keith Ludwig, the best uh, possible person to guide a conversation about costume design. He's a writer and a curator. And uh, they are going to be here talking about uh, um, the remains of the day and their uh, collaboration for the Merchant Ivory Productions. Um, after the, uh, the film, uh, if you have any questions, uh, John and uh, Jenny will be around in the hall. So if you have any questions, just keep them and then you can ask them. And now I will just retire and leave you to it. Thank you very much, Joanna, and uh, a very warm welcome uh, to the Cine Lumiere. And I'm so thrilled that I'm with John Bright and Jenny Bevin uh, to talk about uh, Remains of the Day, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary, which is just extraordinary. It stayed with us. Um, but um, first of all, um, John and Jenny, um, you, were, you were both absolutely uh, so central to uh, some of the most enduring films from The Merchant Ivory, uh, Room with a View, Howard's End. Um, I'd like to just firstly ask, how did you, how did you first uh, meet and how did you first begin uh, working together? Well, my first relationship with Cosprop was probably in 1971 when I designed for the Welsh Theatre Company something called Nightmare Abbey, a gothic tale. And I needed a Victorian suit for a very tall gentleman. And we were obviously doing, you know, it was French theatre, I was Welsh Theatre Company at 80 seats and no money. And one of the cutters there, well, she was a brilliant cutter, but she happened to be there because um, she was married to someone who was living in Wales. And she said, you've got to go meet my friend John Bright. So I did. And of course, the first question you said to me is, so what period is it? I, th I haven't a clue. I mean, I just want a Victorian <laughs> suit black <laughs> for a very tall, thin <laughs> actor. I don't, you know. And um, anyway, so that taught me a lesson. Um, I think the next time must have been when I did Hullabaloo and Peggy Ashcroft needed oh, um, yes. a yeah. Mac from you. Yeah. Um, for that we again, paid for the, um, the RSC production. Exactly, yeah. yeah, and and that's how we met. Um, but then the real one was the Europeans, where I was Judy Moorcroft's assistant, and that was the first sort of big uh, merchant ivory. And John not only provided all the costumes, but also came out to. Um, well, we were in Salem or somewhere, yeah. weren't we? Massachusetts yeah. for the big party scene. And I think that's when I got to know you more yes. as a person. And that's right. Because we were just yeah. together. Yes. And, um, and John, you, you'd founded uh, Cosprop in 1965. Yeah. And uh, was building this really kind of wonderful collection, uh, which was very uh, being used as inspiration and real pieces being used in film film work and stage work, yeah. etc. And uh, was that sort of um, your, your core mission to kind of, kind of use original pieces? Well, no, not necessarily. But because they were so plentiful then, there was the possibility that we could use them. And I think a lot of the ones on the Europeans particularly were real, weren't they? Lots of them, including yeah. that white lace dress that was the first thing I put on Lee Remick. I oh was yes. her dresser, which of course I pricked my finger in, you know, and of course got blood on. <sighs> and of course it was real. And then the U Princess Eugenie lace yes. that you used that every time I pulled her in yeah. <laughs> would give separates. way. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Yeah, th it was a lot of real costumes, yeah. A real yeah. clothing, yeah. yeah. There were. And um, for the film The Bostonians, 
that was the f was that the first time that you uh, uh, co-designed uh, the costumes for uh, for that particular film? Yes. It was, wasn't it? It was, because Judy was supposed to do it, and then she was off a passage to India and left in quite late, I think. And Ismail yes. told me, Jenny, you will do it. And Jim took a risk and let me do it. And John was so extraordinary, and the whole backup support from Cosprop and then came out for the beginning. We'd done it together. There was just no... It wasn't me at all. We I obviously had a massive contribution, but it was both of us. And that started the partnership. Yeah. And so for something like, say, um, A Room with a View, John, um, where, where the, the, the bulk of the clothes, uh, they all come from uh, Cosprop itself? Yes, they did. Yeah. We'd, we didn't really have the money to make very many new ones, and so we had to um, uh, use, use ones that exist or parts of ones that existed. When you're using um, original, original sort of clothing in those sorts of films, um, do things have to be sort of like th uh, strengthened or yeah. elements yeah. Uh, sort of added? Often on something quite fine, uh, we use something called bra net, which is a very fine net, but it's nylon and therefore very tough. And sometimes it gets layered underneath the fragile parts. <laughs> To make sure it all stands there. That, that it, yeah. it lasts. Unfortunately for um, uh, the one that Jenny's talking about, Barnett hadn't come into our orbit. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, when it separated, we had to get ordinary nylon net, try melting it a bit on the iron, <laughs> and put it underneath. Yeah, it was quite... Um, painful. Painful is the word, <laughs> yes. Um, for these for these project projects that are sort of based on a, an original source uh, and just coming on to remains of the day, would you would you always read the original source as well as the screenplay to look for characterization or clues about the clothing or that kind of thing? I do definitely, and then I try and forget it because it's the script we're making, not the book. But I do tend to read the book. I read um, Room with View. I read. Uh, absolutely remains. Um, and I think I might have even read the Pinter script that was done before Ruth did it. But yeah, yeah definitely yes. read the book. I got so confused when I um, read Room with a View as a book that I gave up and waited <laughs> for the script. <laughs> um, it was just that Ruth had a way of introducing the characters in a really good way, which in the book, I'm afraid there were too many characters too soon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I certainly preferred the script. <laughs> yeah, oh, yes. um, when I when I read it. Sometimes the, the script kind of yeah helps uh, yeah. give it shape for the actors, etc. Yes. Focuses et it more, yes. I think. Yeah. 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 Um, w when it comes to uh, remains of the day, um, there were a number of locations used that depict the house, but actually it's, it's several, I understand. We think it was four. I, I, I <laughs> yeah. add in Chiswick House as well, because we definitely shot there, but not inside, I think. Yes, Durham Park was the outside, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then Corsham Court was Had definitely... The blue staircase, which Jim loved. That's so Powderham, wasn't it? Oh, Powderham, sorry. Yeah. Corsham was the room, the dining room, wasn't it? Yeah. And then the room where he says... Save that for later, one of my <laughs> favourite moments. Sorry, I've just, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then Blenheim, it was Blenheim, wasn't it? was the kitchens. Uh, no. Badminton. 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 Yeah. It's a long time ago, it's 30 years. <laughs> it is a long time ago. Um, but yeah, Badminton was the kitchens, because it's mm. got the most beautiful kitchens with mm. amazing copper um, pans and all that. Yeah. Um, when it comes to this, uh, actually, there's two, there's two t periods. There's the, the 50s and the 30s, um, where, where most of the clothes for the 1930s, were they sourced from Cosbrock, John? Were, were a lot made? Um, I don't remember us making very many. I think they were, I I, think I think they were all 
from start. From yeah. Stop. yeah, I don't remember many. I think we bought the odd cardigan. We had yeah. to do something for Christopher Reeve because he was so yeah. tall. I have a feeling we may have made his dinner suit. Yes, I think we did, and the suit that he wears yeah, later. Yeah, the yeah. coat actually came from a very ordinary shop, um, his sort of camel coat, in Exeter because um, it was so classic. It, it yeah. could have been any period. Um, but he, w he was exceptionally tall and... And quite big, actually. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, would you have um, read round the period in terms of doing uh, some research for this particular moment in kind of British history? Uh, how did you sort of approach the screenplay and sort of capturing those people? Oh dear, I think <laughs> I think for me it, it was stuff I already knew from all the other productions. Yeah. Um, I don't think I looked up anything particularly. I think I had a little trawl through my own books, but yeah. to me it's more instinctive because the characters were so clear. And then we used to work, once the were finished for the day, sort of 5.30ish, we'd put the kettle on, we'd have a cup of tea, <laughs> and we'd do a couple of hours, <laughs> uh, you know, looking at clothes, putting them on stands, talking it through, finding fabrics, just having a go. and. Sometimes you overthink things, but I feel I also knew the period from just yeah. films and theatre and, and life. Although I wasn't quite born then, but you know, yeah. it definitely one, one knows. The process actually yeah. is almost always the same. Uh, you know who's playing the part and you have ideas, don't you, about the clothes. And then you have a dress up session. So you learn uh, if people have any objections to certain colours. Uh, green is a, a very, very much a sticking point with a lot of people. <laughs> I think it comes from an old theatre tradition where green meant that the dye might have been arsenic based. <sighs> um, and so um, that was a no-no because it obviously affects the skin if, yeah. if you wear clothes of it. Um, but I think, in, in, in general, one didn't need to uh, look up too much because the clothes, if they were right, said it. Yeah. I, I remember um, that Emma Thompson has a very particular walk. <laughs> That's one of my memories of the film, I mean, and I'll, I'll be watching it again to, yeah. to recall that. She has this incredible walk. Um, our sh shoes are so important for actors to capture a walk, stance. Again, were they something that came from Cosprop, John, or s were they specially made? Or I truly don't remember, but I imagine they're probably from stock because there's a really good stock of 30s at Cosprop. Mm. And often shoes that have been worn are much more comfortable than new ones, even though Mr. Saba used to make a very fine yes, fitted shoe. Sort of shoe. But... Um, my sense is they were probably stopped, but I truly don't remember no. that kind of detail. They, no, they were nothing that special. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> a question about uh, cardigans uh, in the film. Oh, right. <laughs> um, there are a number of uh, scenes involving uh, uh, cardigans. Yes. And I'm just wondering where the kind of cardigans, were they made specially or were they no. fr from, from stock? Things that you, f you, you mm. sourced from Cosprop? No, they were, they were real ones from Cosprop. And it's the first time I've ever had to pull a cardigan into shape. <laughs> and I asked advice <laughs> how to do it. Um, and they said, wash it carefully and uh, put it on a towel to dry and tease it into shape. So I think with the grey and black one, I remember doing as I was told <laughs> and it seemed to work. But I also, I think Anthony Hopkins I bought again, yeah. again from a, Exeter was full of, in those days, sort of old fashioned men's shops that had classic, no, yes. no period. Because yeah. I think we were, we never started with everything, you know, we always added in a bit as mm. we went along mm. and thought through scenes and needed stuff. And I'm pretty sure the one he wears in the butler's pantry, the book scene, um, ah, yes. is, was actually bought in Exeter. Wow. Oh. Um, There's the a very int intense scene where 
uh, Miss Kenton almost uh, corners Anthony Hopkins' character, and it's quite quite sort of dark. Um, do you remember much about the filming of that scene? It was done in the butler's pantry. There was literally room for the actors, yeah. Tony Pierce Roberts, the camera, and Jim. That was it. Yeah. It was a tiny space. So the tension those two produce, the chemistry between them is phenomenal, as the camera must have been like here, you know. Yeah. And they are wearing cardigans. <laughs> and it's the sexiest scene, I think, in cinema. <laughs> Gus goes to show a costume. I mean, isn't going to dictate... Mm. Well, it, they yeah. acted it yeah. through the cardigans. Yeah, so all, all these um, these various locations all had uh, places that could be used in the script. So nothing, no built, no built sets or anything like that. No, oh, no, 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 all, all no. We never went to a studio. Oh, <laughs> we were a sort of <laughs> travelling circus yeah. um, that just dropped anchor wherever. Yeah. And in those days, of course, we go from place to place at night. You had a movement order on your knee as you drove. No sat navs. It got so lost getting to whichever <laughs> hotel or B and B they put you in. I can remember trailing round the West Country, <laughs> hopelessly, and um, um, and then we sort of we did have a wardrobe truck on remains though. Um, it was our first, I think. That was the first time you had a truck where you had everything together. To my best belief, yeah. I don't think yeah. we had one on the bus. Oh, we might have had. No, I think we travel most things in trucks, but not a proper wardrobe truck. I think Remains was the first <laughs> wardrobe truck. It sounds like a very challenging way of working. Yes. <laughs> Actually, the Bostonians was mainly tents, wasn't it? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> it, yeah. But to move the stuff from like Boston uh, down to yeah. Martha's Vineyard, That's I remember right. that just on a, on a lorry. Yeah, uh, But not a, you know, working lorry. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah, it was all quite primitive. But, you know, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. You didn't question it. Now, you'd, you'd die. Right. Well, I mean, I do it on a short film, but yeah. um, so very rarely. A lot of imp imp improvising um, from, oh, you, yeah. from your point of view. Is Massively. Massively, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, later on in the film, actually, it jumps between the two periods. Um, we have the 1950s when they, 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 meet, they meet again. Um, and I understand, Jenny, that was uh, the idea of some of those clothes were drawn from your own family experience, I've Absolutely. read. Absolutely. My grandmother, we used to go to Paynton every year for our summer holidays. And my grandmother um, wore quite specific, she was quite a precise lady and quite old fashioned and quite, you know, conventional. And there was something about her max and her always wore a hat or a headscarf and wore white sandals. And she just was perfect for Emma at that point. So Emma is based definitely on my grandmother, Nana. And then there's the guy in the pub um, is based on my dad in a tassel shirt and a v-neck pullover. It's a little homage, you know, <laughs> personal. But hopefully appropriate. <laughs> there are these kind of huge themes in, in the film, the backdrop of the, the, the 30s. But actually, it's really about two, two people uh, and the, and their story, yeah, um, and and yeah, and that sort of almost painful emo em emotion, and it still packs a, a powerful punch today. I think. I th I still weep, particularly at the end. But um, you know, I just think it's, and the performances of those two are just phenomenal. I hope you agree. I mean, I'm just still in awe of what they did. Well, the f the film's an absolute classic. And here we are, 30 years later, about to uh, have a wonderful screening of it. Um, now, I understand that um, there'll be some, maybe some questions at the end. Uh, if, you're, if you're both happy to uh, stay around, yeah. uh, we're going to watch the film, and then people might have some yeah, thoughts, thoughts and feelings about Remains of the Day. So hopefully, uh, John and Jenny, you can stay, and uh, if you have something. Oh, some questions. We've got time for some questions now. Ah, ah, okay, lovely, great. If anyone has any questions pre pre screening, then please do ask away. Ah, yes, there's a, a question there. Gosh, this is great. Hi, can I just ask you? You just showed a picture of um, the uh, fox hunting scene. Do you know who supplied the clothing, because obviously modern day horse riding clothing is a lot different to what it was in the 1930s. The lovely, w was it the people that 
um, came with the horses? Did they have their own costumes or did you actually source the hunting attire? No, they, they came with it. It was the Beaufort Hunt. Oh, right. And okay. they came with it. Yeah. We, um, I'm absolutely sure we didn't, no, we didn't do it at no, all. definitely we didn't. And okay, sorry, sorry I've asked a question that doesn't relate to you. No, <laughs> um, no but I mean, the thing was, if, if people could provide something in those days, you know, they did. And I think they, were, they obviously used their old-fashioned coats, not their poly... I, I don't know. I think the Beaufort is a very traditional hunt. Yeah. And obviously they brought the horses and whatever the tack and all that, yeah. Anybody else? Oh yes, lovely, thank you. Hello Jenny, hello John. Um, I just wanted to ask, when you work together, do you, is it a very organic process? Do you split things up like ladies or men's wear or it's a sort of... <laughs> well, us two. <laughs> yes, the two of you. I think organic is the word, wouldn't <laughs> you, John? It's completely organic. I mean, yeah. John, obviously, particularly at the beginning, was far more, and um, still is, far more, um, you know, learned about costume, about clothing, about periods. I came in as the sort of slightly scatty theatre designer who <laughs> never thought I'd do costume. I wanted to be a set designer. I wanted to create worlds on stage and build massive sculptural sets. It wasn't my deal at all. So I had to learn it all, and of course I learned it from John. Although I'd been well taught at college, but... Basically, I learned from John. So he would be the, the wise one. And I would be probably not really more the storyteller, because he's a brilliant storyteller. But I think I sort of took on the storytelling role and the logistics role and, um, you know, making sure we had lists of what we needed. And then and I'd do a lot of the pulling and then you'd refine it. But it was pretty organic, wasn't Completely. it? Completely, yeah. Yeah. Completely organic. Uh, no plan. <laughs> um, well, apart from Jenny's lists, they were very Good planned. Yeah. Um, so we did know what we were aiming at when we started, but uh, definitely the dressing up session uh, was the important thing because, as I say, you learnt about people's reaction to colour, particularly green. Luckily, Maggie Smith wasn't on that. Mm. Um, particular <laughs> film, otherwise we'd have heard quite a lot about green, wouldn't we? We probably would have. As you did on Gosford Park. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just seeing people in clothes and seeing how they move and react in them, you know whether it's right or whether it's um, not helpful to them. And of course, you know, sometimes uh, actors have a very clear idea of the way they want to look, even if they don't know the specifics of it. And that's quite helpful. Um, there's one scene in, in Howard's End where Vanessa Redgrave told us exactly how she should look, and we complied, and she was right. It's a scene, if anyone's seen Howard's End, it's a scene in Fortnum's where she wears a very light outfit um, and we had thought that it would be darker because it was winter and she said no it must be light and then she proceeded to tell us how it should be and that was very helpful actually yes yeah, she was absolutely right she was like a ghost yeah because she was dying and it she knew it the character knew it but we hadn't picked up on that. Often it's such a collaboration with actors if you get on well with them. And it's so lovely. It's, you're not a fashion designer. You're not telling them what to wear. You are very much part of a team with them. And that's really the fun of the job, a storytelling team member. And that's, um, that's a process that, that you apply to your projects, John, isn't it? That you're, yeah. with, you're with the actors and you have, you've pulled the clothes and you kind of you know, work out the scenes and and what they sort of feel about the clothing itself. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. Um, do we have time for another question? Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is more of a general question about, uh, because you both have had such a prolific career in um, each of you in costume design that kind of deals with different genres, whether that's period dramas or with fantasy or science fiction of the like. Is there ever a specific approach you make to each project or does it all boil down to character or storytelling? 
I think it all, you do it the same way, whatever it is. It's based on the script and the story you want to tell, or the director wants to tell. If some have a very specific vision, some want you to do it. it that's, but it's always the same process, be it post-apocalyptic, Jane Austen, or whatever. So that's how I approach it. The thing that will change, if you're doing things like the Merchant Ivory films, we could use John Stock. If you're doing Fury Road or... Um, what have I done recently? Something else very modern. You have uh, things like Alexander or... Um, Cruella, something like Cruella. Cruella, yeah. You have to make a lot because it... Well, Cruella ex a lot existed, but we had to make a lot because of stunts on that but, um, and because of the specifics of the story. But there are films where you can't... There isn't a stock, i.e. Fury Road, Mad Max. So you make it all. So it's a, just a different way of approaching the logistics of it, but the actual storytelling remains the same. Yeah, another question? Hi there. Um, my question is more specifically for Remains of the Day. I mean, I seem to remember there being a lot of uh, scenes with men in suits, and I'm wondering when you have, you know, 100 men in suits around a table or something like that, how do you differentiate character, you know, when the suits are largely the same, especially for the time period? I'm afraid I didn't hear. I didn't, no, I didn't yeah, quite catch sorry. that. Sorry, is that better? How do you differentiate the men's suits? Because there are loads of people just wearing suits. Uh, and so how do you differentiate character with the, the suits? Is that, that was right, wasn't it? Yeah, correct, it? thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I think often it's um, what the suit is being worn for. So if it's in, in town and it's a dark suit, that might be right for a solicitor or, or someone. And I think the higher up they are in, in their profession, the, how well the, the suit is cut. So you choose to fit into exactly what their what they're about in, in the script terms. But Some I people you can put sort of really rubbishy suits on <laughs> and they still look marvellous, <laughs> but um, others need the definition from a well-cut suit. And so I think there is a difference, isn't there? Well, I think in Remains, where they're all basically quite similar and you just try them on and you know when it works. And obviously they all had to have evening dress because they were and they yep. had to have stuff for the conference, and then they had their travelling gear. It was really three sets of outfits. But the actors were so different within them. Yeah. And that's what gives, really, the character. And in something like Remains, you don't really want to muffle the words and the action with costume. It's not about that. So you just try and fit them. John's dressing up thing, fitting them, is to make it just work. And you just know when a... When a Someone looks completely natural in a suit. Because sometimes they don't. They just look like no. they're wearing a costume. But it's a <laughs> dressing up game. That certainly is a point with uh, Tony, with his um, black jacket. Uh -huh. I think they probably tried about six different jackets on it. And it wasn't the smartest one that won, was it? No, I, d I just remember he also um, obviously plays the butler older. And so I think we got perfect looks on him for the 30s. And I remember then starting on the 50s fittings, and I said to him, do you want to show, you know, would you like me to find a jacket that's smaller so that it feels a bit tight because you're older? And he just turned to me and said, no, Jenny. He said, you do the costume, I'll do the acting. <laughs> and I thought <laughs> that was absolutely <laughs> brilliant because he was absolutely right to stop, you know, but he was the kind of actor <laughs> who would make it work whatever. <laughs> I, I learned another lesson. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, some more questions. Great. Hi. Um, I just wondered, uh, I sort of got two questions, but um, oh. I've only got time for one, that's fine, but um, they're kind of the same thing. Uh, in terms of, obviously, your careers, you both had really long careers, and I just wondered whether you found that there are challenges as a costume designer that you face, particularly in the film industry now, that you didn't 
20 or 30 years ago, and equally to John, whether there are challenges now with running a costume hire house that are new, that were different from 20 or 30 years ago? Yeah, I think the best example of that is um, sometimes uh, years ago, when we weren't working for Merchant Ivory, we were given three months or more to get the clothes together, whereas sometimes designers come to me and they say, I've got five weeks to do this production. And you think, well, you're not going to have much made then, are you? Because by the time <laughs> you get the actor and their, uh, their uh, deal is done, mm -hmm. you're going to have two weeks. And so um, it is really quite different from how it was in the sedate 60s, for instance, <laughs> uh, where I think the first film we really worked on was a film called A Charge of the Light Brigade with David Hemmings. And it was um, very, very gently done. And um, I think in the end, we had or notification of that 12 week period that we had later on. And, but now sometimes people say that um, unfortunately the actor can't come to you <laughs> because um, <laughs> we're filming in Yugoslavia or somewhere and he'll go straight from LA to Yugoslavia. And then I said, well, how can we make anything? And so uh, a talk begins and they say, well, we have got one of his suits. <laughs> and so you think, well, on your own head be it, but we'll, we'll try and work from that. And, um, you know, sometimes that's what you have to do. That's funny. I mean, I, I find the challenge is more... Um, uh, I think it's, it's um, the, yes, the expectation you can do it in incredibly little time. Yeah. I always call them rescue missions. I've been done quite a few recently. Um, um, they are lastminute.com, including Corella. But I wouldn't have done it without Claire Sprague, who said, we can do this. And might have lived to regret it, but she's here still, so that's all right. Um, but no, it, 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 and they're so much bigger. I mean, literally, we used to do it on tiny crews. And it was extremely hard work. But we did survive. But now, you know, you're managing massive crew. I always think I'm like the conductor of the orchestra, and I've got all these different sections, you know, the leaders of each section, the main cutters and chief dyers and all that. But it's, it's more like almost managerial. And then the PR with producers and directors, and ee, it's, it's slightly another world until you do go back. Occasionally I do really small short films for friends or whatever, and, and you back to the real world. Yeah. Gosh. Do we have time for one more? Yes? <laughs> Hi there, thank you very much for the, for the discussion. Um, you've obviously collaborated quite a few times and I was wondering whether there was a particular project or particular collaboration that you worked on that really stood out to you. I didn't hear. Oh, so you a, oh, particular project. Stood out. I mean, they were all pretty spect <laughs> special. I think just working with John, was, it was just fun and so kind of creative. I mean, I now tend to work on my own, and I still enjoy it hugely, um, on the whole. I mean, there are odd moments, obviously, but it's still a really fun thing to do because every project's different. But I think on ours, I mean, I do love Remains. It is one of my... It's not showy costume-wise, but it's just such a complete film, and that's the pleasure for me. Although then I look at Howard's End and think, yeah, well, yes, or we'll Morris. When we saw the clip from Morris the other day, it was like, oh, God, that's a good yeah. film. I think for me it was Howard's End, probably, um, because of the differences. Uh, for instance, when uh, Jackie Bast turns up at the, uh, the wedding in the country and she's slightly inebriated, um, <laughs> and... The local extras we had apparently had been coming to the house we filmed in, to weddings, over 
maybe the last 25 years or something. And so they were used to the environment, but then when this person came into that environment, their reactions were absolutely spot on. And you can't always say that about the extras. Sometimes they're not focused at all on what is happening. They just want to get another day over with. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, it is a, a wonderful film.